Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to uh, kick off and welcome uh, everyone here to uh, our final colloquium of the season. Uh, and it is especially my pleasure to welcome our final speaker for the season, uh, Mike Boy Boylan Colchin, uh, who has bravely agreed to uh, brave the frigid New Jersey winter uh, away from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so thank you for joining us here. Uh, Mike uh, received his PhD from UC Berkeley uh, and then went on to fellowships uh, at the Max Planck Institute and at UC Irvine. Uh, he then uh, uh, started as a professor at the University of Maryland uh, before moving to Austin, uh, where he has been since 2015. Um, Mike's research uh, focuses on uh, various aspects of galaxy formation, near field cosmology, the nature uh, and characteristics of dark matter. Uh, I think you'll all agree with me that his work covers an impressive range, uh, but, uh, an, an impressive range, uh, and an impressive um, scale uh, of sizes, as well as an impressive nature of different types of ways to study these scales. Uh, he studied everything from uh, theories and analytical models of globular cluster formation uh, through uh, observations to study the dynamics of dwarf galaxies in the local group, uh, and all the way to very large scale cosmological simulations uh, and cosmic reionization. Um, uh, Mike is an NSF Career Award recipient, uh, and on a more personal note, he has been uh, involved in some way or another in all of my career as an astrophysicist, starting from uh, taking my first cosmology class with Netta uh, uh, as an undergrad here at Princeton, where of course she showed me the Millennium Simulations, uh, thank you for that, uh, and all the way through starting a PhD and, have, and receiving his review article uh, uh, as required reading in the first week of my work with Katherine Johnston. Uh, Mike has coined uh, some of the important things that we study uh, in, uh, in dark matter uh, and, this, and the challenges, the small scale challenges, including uh, probably the most famous, which is the too big to fail problem. Um, but uh, he, and today he will tell us about um, cosmology and galaxy formations at the galaxy formation at the crossroads. So thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mike. Uh, <laughs> Well, thanks very much for the very nice introduction, Tomer. I'd like to take you around with me now, uh, moving forward, so that everybody can he hear something like that. Uh, and thanks, uh, thank you for the the very kind welcome. Um, it's been let's see a few years since I've been able to visit Princeton. I was here before the pandemic in the physics department. The last time I was at the astronomy department was maybe 2005, um, and I don't think I've ever been to the institute. So it's great to great to be here. Um, you know, it's it's always a little embarrassing to talk about cosmology at Princeton, but uh, this is, you know, I think it, it's an exciting subject, and so I'll try to to do justice to the the great legacy here. Uh, and of course, contractually, I'm obligated to start with the the picture of the the CMB. Uh, so we have a great model of cosmology, of course, and a lot of it comes from taking uh, the, the distribution of temperatures we observe in the microwave background and uh, assuming some kind of physical model for the evolution of the universe. So we have the coupled Boltzmann-Einstein um, equations and, and uh, with some assumptions there, then we can get to modeling the power spectra of the CMB and come out with some physical characteristics. So the the standard lambda CDM model has these, these six parameters. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and from that modeling, of course, we end up understanding the matter and energy content of our universe. And that determines things like the expansion rate, et cetera. So we have this uh, somewhat confusing situation where we have an extremely precise model where we know the components very well, but we don't know what the components actually are. And so we'd like to understand this a lot better, I think. Um, so we have a very successful um, standard cosmological paradigm, but there are a lot of open questions. The paradigm is called lambda CDM. We don't know what lambda is and we don't know what CDM is. So that's kind of a problem if that's the name of the paradigm. We also, with the, the CDM side, you know, not only have we not been able to detect it other than through its gravitational influence on, um, on sort of baryonic matter, we also don't know its properties on, on very small scales. We don't know, for example, is it truly cold? And uh, we also don't know, is it truly collisionless? So CDM um, usually means cold dark matter, but also we take as, as the baseline that it has no self-interactions, that it's a completely collisionless fluid. 
that's something that we don't really understand as uh, if, if that's actually true as well. Uh, and that's related to the question of how accurate is this model and its predictions on nonlinear scales. So in the present day universe, that means going down to scales that are below masses of about 10 to the 13 solar masses or length scales of, uh, of order a couple of megaparsecs. Uh, and, and I think a question that I do have an answer to, do we have a predictive theory of galaxy formation within Lambda CDM? I think the answer is no. And I think hopefully uh, that'll become clear during the talk. And that's a good thing because you know I wanna stay in business at some level. Uh, and the other question of course is, is this it, right? Is the six parameter Lambda CDM model complete? And in a sense, I, I hope the answer is no, because um, we may not, well, you know, the goal is to understand Lambda and CDM, but so far we haven't really gotten to the fundamental nature. And if we just keep in the situation where it seems to match all the observations, but we can't actually understand the fundamental nature of some of its constituents, that'll be very unsatisfying. It's an option, you know, nature doesn't have to satisfy us, but, uh, um, but we'd like to understand is this six parameter lambda CDM model really all there is, or is there something beyond this? So in my mind, um, you know, people sometimes think, oh, isn't this great? We've finally done it. We've got a model for the universe. To me, this is the starting point, right? We, we have a very phenomenological model where we don't understand its main components. We don't understand a lot about how it interacts with galaxy formation. So there's still some work to be done, um, which is a good thing for, well, for me, certainly, but I think certainly for students uh, in the audience as well, right? Don't, don't listen to anybody who says that, that uh, cosmology and galaxy formation is done. There's a lot to do. Um, okay, so we all know Lambda CDM works really well in the linear regime. So linear means here the fluctuations are very small, the fluctuations um, in, in density or temperature. So one example here is the CMB power spectrum, the temperature power spectrum from the, the Planck collaboration. Um, I guess we have some fuzzy dark matter in the background there, some <laughs> turbulence. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so, you know, at redshift of, of 1090, we know that the, the RMS amplitude of the temperature fluctuations are order apart in 100,000. So this is something where, uh, you know, the, everything is very close to the mean temperature. Everything is very close to the mean density. We can use linear theory. Um, that's great. And, but of course, we're really, again, looking at very large scales and we're thinking here. So just so we're all kind of on the same page, um, this is in multipole space L, if we want to think about what that corresponds to in sort of mass scales or physical lengths, uh, the sort of largest nonlinear structures today would be at um, sort of a multipole of, of 3000 or so that would contain an average mass of around 10 to the 15 solar masses. And if we're thinking about the scales of dwarf galaxies, where we're thinking about maybe small scale problems or challenges to the cosmological model, that's another factor of 10 out in multipole. So multipole of 30,000 or so mass scales, well, sorry, that's uh, for, that would even be for the Milky Way, right? So uh, dwarf galaxies would be another factor of 10 beyond that multipole of 300,000. So we're not gonna study dwarf galaxies in the CMB. Um, sadly, that would be actually really helpful if we could actually do this and, and understand everything in the linear regime um, from the CMB. But the linear physics that we understand for CMB basically cut out here at, uh, at very large mass scales. So it's, it's comparable to the masses of the largest serialized objects today. Um, but it, it works very well. And that means we can start at this CMB epoch and make predictions that um, are anchored in the CMB and use only linear theory. And so we can evolve that uh, a statistical realization of that temperature field and look at the density field. So that's what we do for numerical simulations. So what I've done here is I've, I've done that. Uh, actually, somebody else did that. This is the, the illustrious simulation, the initial conditions. And what you do for the illustrious simulation initial conditions, you don't start at the CMB and, and run your numerical simulation. Everything's so, so well in the linear regime, you can do calculations to bring that forward to about a factor of 10 um, larger in expansion, so a redshift of 120 or so, and, uh, and do your, your numerical calculation starting there, your big cosmological simulation. We can even go farther. We can use linear theory and extrapolate all the way to the present day. So this is what that same density field would look like using linear theory to extrapolate to the present. Okay, and if I flip back and forth between those two, you can see that the sort of, um, 
the densest region, every, every spot just changes in intensity here because you're basically just, everything is, is linear. So every, um, every mode evolves independently and you just have to change the amplitude of, of the density fluctuation at each, each spot here. Uh, so when you take this and you actually uh, sort of do the characteristics, you're thinking about the, the matter power spectrum. Okay, and, and so then we can compare the predictions of this linear theory extrapolated to redshift zero over a wider range of scales. So now we're seeing the CMB on, on much, uh, on very large scales here. And again, sort of down here, the smallest scales we're looking at um, on, on the plot, the, the, the largest K modes are, are now of order uh, 30,000 in multiple. So this is sort of the, the scale that would correspond maybe to a fluctuation that would form a galaxy like the Milky Way also, okay. But the point here is that in linear theory and when we look not just at the CMB, but we look at galaxy clustering, we look at um, statistics of intergalactic gas, all of the physics in the linear regime seems to work out quite well. Uh, and, and that's fantastic. And again, this is described in a model with only six parameters, six star parameters. There are a lot of sort of auxiliary assumptions that go into this. You need to understand, uh, you need to assume the universe has no spatial curvature. You need to make a certain assumptions about the, uh, the way neutrinos contribute to the energy density evolution. You need to make assumptions about the number of degrees of relativistic uh, freedom, a, a number of relativistic species at early times, but but again, the six main parameters describe this curve very well, and it's not just fitting the CMB at redshift of, um, of 1100, it's fitting all of the data here from redshift of 1100, basically down to redshift zero. Uh, okay, so again, we can do this extrapolation in linear theory down to redshift zero, but the universe does a different extrapolation. Right, the universe uses nonlinear physics to do these kind of scales. And so when we actually want to understand what's happening, we can't just use this linear theory extrapolation. So what we'd really like to understand is uh, how this actual network of filaments, voids, galaxies evolves, uh, and, and can we make predictions for that regime? So the deeply nonlinear regime where the variation from place to place and the density isn't a part in 100,000, but maybe a part, uh, you know, 10 to the 30 or something like that. We're a fluctuation that's 10 to the 30 times the cosmic mean right here in the, in the room. Uh, and so, of course, this is one of the goals of big space telescopes now. Uh, this is something that I think Roman has been involved with. So you can make a huge computer simulation that does a realization of that universe and look at the evolution of the density on very large scales and then make galaxy catalogs that go along with that, right? Um, and so you see on the bottom here, just this, um, this cutout on the bottom from the top, this is about, uh, about a, a gigaparsec on a side. What we'd really like to understand is take the smallest parts here, right? And zoom in in great detail and understand their properties. So this is the Milky Way uh, simulated in dark matter only, now on a scale that's a thousand times smaller, so in something like a megaparsec across. And each of these is an enormous computational undertaking. You can't do uh, enormous sets of these. And so what we'd like to understand is, is there a way to make these predictions maybe without having to resort to numerical simulations as well? Um, and it, so another way to say that is, what, what can we use from our sort of simple knowledge of linear physics to understand the nonlinear universe? Um, and, and I think there is a nice way to do this. This dates back to basically uh, Press and Schechter and it's been modified from there. And the idea is that the linear matter power spectrum does contain information about the statistics of the nonlinear density field. So, um, you know, we, we sort of ask, okay, if we take a, draw a circle and just ask how much matter, okay, it's a circle here, but a sphere in the universe and you, add, and you move it around from point to point and you ask how much mass is in that sphere and look at the, the variance of that. Well, on very large scales, large circles, there's a small variance. As you go to smaller and smaller circles, you get larger and larger variance. That is, uh, the circles may be in a region with less density or more density, but as you get to very big circles, you, you're getting back close to the cosmic mean. So um, this is the, the sort of uh, another way to encapsulate the power spectrum of, of density fluctuations in lambda CDM, that's the, the RMS mass fluctuations. 
And this encodes hierarchical structure formation. You see that the, the fluctuations are larger on, on small scales. Okay. Um, and, and so this model that Preston Schechter came up with and that's been, been in, um, fine tuned since then is that if we can understand the statistics of, of the density field in this way, we can understand the, uh, the, the number density of, of collapsed objects in the density field. So that is just with this same linear physics, the six parameter model that gives us this nice linear theory prediction, we can understand the nonlinear distribution of, of dark matter halos. And the model is pretty simple. Um, we basically just say that we need to be above some, um, some amplitude of, of fluctuation to collapse. So uh, the, if you're dense enough, you will start to collapse up and that density threshold in linear theory is uh, 1.7, it doesn't really matter what the exact number is. And today the halos that are sort of just collapsing up typically are around 10 to the 13 solar masses. If I wanted to ask at earlier times, what would this look like? The density threshold would be higher. And so it would be only smaller mass objects that are collapsing up. Um, so this is in the mean what's happening, but you could have, uh, there's an entire spectrum of fluctuations, right? With different amplitudes at a given, given mass. And so it could be that at a little bit more massive scale, uh, you might, although you're on average below that collapse threshold, there are some parts of the universe where you're able to get above that collapse threshold. And we measure that um, by something called the peak height. So that peak height is just how far away from the collapse threshold are you? That means how far out in the tail of the distribution do you have to go uh, to find a collapse? How rare is it, is it to find an object of that mass that's collapsed? And we'd say that, for example, today at 10 to the 15 solar mass halo is, is sort of a 3.5 sigma peak in the density field. So it's pretty rare to find 10 to the 15 solar mass objects that are collapsed. And the abundance of these objects is um, sort of exponentially suppressed lower to smaller mass objects. So, um, but, but this is great because now we have a model that says, okay, if I, if I know the linear physics, then I can make predictions about the, the statistics in the nonlinear density field. And that means I can start to compare to observations. So this shows you how um, objects of a given peak height evolve with time. So uh, one sigma fluctuation is sort of the typical object that's collapsing at that time. Uh, much rarer fluctuation would be a peak height of three, four, five, six. And at, at early times, we would like to ex explore these rare fluctuations in the density field. That'll tell us something about lambda CDM, and it'll also tell us about uh, the, the statistics of, of galaxy formation. So with something like Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to, to reach back to say Redshift 10 and fairly massive systems with, uh, with, with things like uh, the Rubin Observatory, we'll be able to look at very low mass systems very nearby. So the sort of corner down here, we could hope that 21 centimeter observatories might give us uh, information further out at, at these rare fluctuations. But what we'd really like to do is push this back further time, earlier times, further back in time and understand more about the, the properties of the, these rare peaks at early times and, what, and rare peaks that are lower mass. And so this is where JWST might come in. So JWST, of course, uh, has been incredibly successful and part of the, the motivation for, for launching this, this infrared space telescope is that um, its coverage of the rest frame UV uh, maps onto earlier times in the universe. So we're looking for um, intensely star forming galaxies that emit most of the light in the in the rest frame UV that's redshifted out into the infrared. And so we can see galaxies now, not just out to redshift 789, but maybe out to 15, maybe even higher if we're lucky. Good. So in, in this um, picture that I've just been talking about, we could ask what should we have expected with JWST? And so uh, the, the predictions from Lambda CDM are the statistics of the collapsed objects. So we know the mass functions, okay? And so you can see here, this is a cumulative mass function at, at various different redshifts. And you can see the number density of halos above a given halo mass as a function of that mass evolves very rapidly from redshift um, seven. That's the sort of 
um, orange here as we go back in time to Redshift 16. So uh, for example, if I ask at Redshift 16, what's the abundance of halos more massive than 10 to the 10 solar masses? It's something like uh, 100,000 times less than that same mass threshold at Redshift 7. So the density field evolves very quickly in those times in the universe. Um, yes. The yes, the co-moving, absolutely, thanks. Um, right, so, you know, unfortunately uh, for me and, and for everybody who cares about dark matter, we don't see dark matter, we see these pesky baryons. And so um, when we wanna probe this density field, we actually have to use the baryons to do it. So what would our assumption be? Well, if I have a dark matter halo of a given mass, the, the uh, fluctuations are adiabatic. And so that means that uh, the fluctuations in all the species are the same uh, relative amount everywhere. And so we have a certain amount of baryons that's associated with that amount of dark matter. So if I have a halo of a given mass, the uh, uh, sort of reservoir of baryons I have available to it is just given by the cosmic baryon fraction, that is, the baryon density relative to the matter density times that halo mass. Okay, so that tells us the reservoir of baryons we have for a given halo. Um, and then we can just say, well, the amount of stars we should see in that, that halo is some number, some conversion efficiency, how many of those baryons actually get converted into stars, what fraction actually of baryons get converted into stars times um, the, the baryon reservoir. And that better be less than the total amount of baryons. You shouldn't create more stars than the material you have to create stars out of. Right? Um, and so what this says is you actually have a way of uh, figuring out a sort of lower limit on the halo mass you have to have if you observe a galaxy with a given stellar mass. That is, you have to have at least that baryonic reservoir to form that halo, uh, to form that galaxy. Or equivalently, if I know of the mass of a dark matter halo, I have some um, upper limit on the amount of stars that can form there. So this is a way we can make at least a limiting uh, correspondence between the, the dark matter halos that are predicted from theory and the galaxies that are observed observationally. And you know, it all looks very simple when I do this here, it just galaxy formation is this conversion efficiency as a function of, of halo mass. Uh, this is basically the work of thousands and thousands of people over many, many years. So I don't wanna pretend this is easy, uh, but I think that one can parameterize this. And so this is something that we, um, we will we'll be trying to learn about with this. Okay, so what should we expect with JWST? Well, pre-date JWST, uh, the point is that we understood galaxy formation to be inefficient. Inefficient in the sense that the, given the reservoir of baryons you have, not all of those are converted into stars, not even half or, or, or anywhere near that are converted into stars. And so here's, a, I think, state-of-the-art pre-JWST kind of predictions from, uh, from Peter Bruzzi's universe machine. This is from a paper by Ethan, uh, or this from, by a paper from Peter Bruzzi, also using some work from Ethan Nadler. But what you can see is um, this shows you the stellar mass, the halo mass relation as a function of halo mass. These are um, some predictions and the predictions vary a little bit with redshift, but the point is they're all um, pretty well below any kind of highly efficient conversion. So uh, conversion efficiency of 10% would lie at this horizontal line here. And uh, you can see that nowhere in the universe is that sort of predicted except at say Milky Way mass halos. And if we extended this out to more massive objects, you'd see this turnover. So this curve wouldn't keep rising. Um, and so if we wanna ask what, what would sort of maximal conversion efficiency be, that would be up here. So that would be um, something that is just never observed in the, in the, in the local universe or uh, predictions out to higher redshifts pre-JWST. Uh, another way we can think about this is that if you look at the cosmic star formation rate density, so you take a volume of space and just ask what's the star formation rate in that volume of space, again, co-moving, uh, and look at that, that has a very characteristic shape that uh, rises from early times to redshift two or so, and then falls off. And the predictions, uh, well, the observations here at redshift, out to redshift 10 or so, were that uh, this falls off fairly steeply. This is falling off um, 
sort of like a one plus redshift cubed. Uh, this is sort of just a, a fit that Medow and, and Dickinson did in their famous review article. But uh, the, the data pre-JWST were fit pretty well with a, with a star formation rate density that falls off pretty steeply. And that could be matched with just assuming that the dark matter halos have a constant star formation efficiency. That is the conversion of these baryons of gas into stars happens with a relatively constant efficiency. So, okay, I guess I, I probably don't need to tell you JWST turned on, found galaxies everywhere. And so one of the initial questions about this is, does that early prediction, uh, pre-JWST prediction, I guess is only, the only way you can make a prediction is beforehand. It's otherwise it's more of a post-diction. So were those predictions right? Um, so again, here's that same plot from uh, Harakane et al, uh, 2022. By now take, the same authors and they've updated their plot for 2023. They've conveniently changed the color of the line. So the red line is actually supposed to be the same line as the blue line on the right plot. Uh, I don't know if this is a subtle redshift uh, hint or something. Anyway, I think it was mostly to confuse me initially, but what, what you can see is the JWST data have not followed the trend that were there pre-JWST. So this is the sort of highest redshift point from before. Now JWST is pushing out to much higher redshift and you're seeing things all sitting above this curve of constant star formation efficiency. Okay. So, um, you know, another way to look at it, you can just kind of zoom in on that region. This is uh, very similar data just from a different group. And, and if you're really looking at how different is the actual observation from the predictions uh, at redshift 13, we're talking about an order of magnitude more UV luminosity density at those times. So this is a pretty substantial difference in what was going on. So, yes. Blind extrapolation of what was seen at lower redshift, or is it a specific, a specific model for uh, going from fresh sector to start? Uh, right, so, so this, this blue curve here and the red curve in the previous version is basically taking press Schachter or whatever your favorite uh, model, maybe something calibrated from numerical simulations, and just assuming there's a constant uh, conversion efficiency of gas into stars. So that's, that's what the, the blue uh, line is, yeah. And the, um, the gray is just the fit that Medow and Dickinson had used, so that's not a physical anything. Microscopically or not? Uh, I'd say that if you asked, what, let's say there are 100 galaxies in here, maybe 10 of them would be spectroscopic at this point. So this is mostly based on photometric data, not spectroscopic data. And that's an important point. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, people have gone and looked at the, the photometric versus spectroscopic data, and there are failure modes, certainly. But the failure modes aren't frequent, I think. There are certain cases, especially certain extreme ones, where the expected photometric redshift turned out to be incorrect. But the vast majority of cases with JWST, when people have followed up with a spectrum, it's been pretty close to the, the photometric redshift, you know, sort of within, a, uh, so let's say, 10%, not sort of factors of several different. But that's an important caveat. This is, uh, this is photometric data predominantly at this point. Yeah. Constant star formation efficiency at a given halo mass, because we already know in the universe that that's not the case. So, so what what is being held constant? That's right. So, um, it's true that the, the, the plot I showed earlier shows that it's it's mostly uh, that a very steep decline towards lower uh, halo masses. So here, I believe the model is that uh, there is it is just a constant star formation efficiency with halo mass, uh, and that's this ten percent number, but you're dominated by the most massive systems in this case. So it's really, you're only probing a very small range in masses. So it's not a terrible assumption to say that you have a constant star formation efficiency here. So halo is at a given, you know, what you're dominated by at a given. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? So, um, you said this is for roughly uh, 0 0.1 uh, uh, star formation efficiency. So, so that means that the upper limit will be something like 10 times higher than this. That's right. Yes. 
offset this this curve by by one time. Uh, right. So if, if the yeah, you shift the curves up by a factor of uh, a ten at a at a fixed halo mass to to do this. Uh, so assu assuming you're doing a halo mass limited sample, which wouldn't be the observations, but would be how a theorist would do it. You just shift everything up by a factor of ten would be how much you'd get. Right? Yeah. Uh, not just the same constant star formation rate, but the same IMF. Uh, yes. If the IMF changes at the earliest galaxies, that will change the prediction. So absolutely, and uh, you know, I probably have a slide on that later. But yes, the, you know, what we're seeing is is the UV light. The UV light is dominated by the most massive stars. The stellar mass is dominated by the low mass stars that you don't actually see, and so we need some way to to match between the, the UV luminosity and the stellar mass. For, um, for some of these models, right? Um, here, if you're really just measuring the UV luminosity density, that's a different question, of course. But then how you get the star formation, uh, the integrated star formation efficiency does require the IMF. So this would assume a constant IMF, yes. Is this blue red curve um, to the sort of underlying high redshift halo mass function that you're using. Do we know that well enough to know that it's not going to, we have more maybe, you know, higher high redshift halos than we expected? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it is sensitive to that. Um, and you're in sort of asked, you're, and that's part of the interest here. You're probing the exponential tail of some kind of distribution of fluctuations. But the underlying fluctuations are known very well, you know, in, in Lambda CDM. So the, the baseline prediction is good. Now the question is how accurately can you do that? So you can take these models like press Schechter or extended press Schechter, you can compare them to numerical simulations and that's sort of the game that people are starting to play now before nobody cared about a 10% error here. Now we're starting to really care about a 10% error, but that's an important place where there is work to be done in calibrating how can you do this linear to nonlinear um, sort of extrapolation without having to do all of the numerical simulations. Uh, I will say that most of the models actually seem to overpredict the number of, of massive halos, but that's, I think, you know, again, something that we'll still have, which means that, you know, you sort of would actually have less star, predict that there should be less star formation than these models would say. Uh, so this is sort of the, the differential um, efficiency in the sense that this is the star formation rate. There's also a question of the, the masses of these objects. So there are claims of extremely massive galaxies at early times. So not just that these things are forming stars at an incredible rate, but they've actually built up a lot of stellar mass. So this is one of the, the, the biggest early claims from JWST. This is a paper by Yuvo LeBay that shows the stellar masses of a handful of sources. These are all photometric, not spectroscopic. What you can see is there's sort of six or so galaxies in this sample that are above 10 to the 10 solar masses in the range of redshift seven to nine or so. And just for sort of uh, comparison, the Milky Way today sits at a few times 10 to the 10, maybe six times 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, no one really knows what the Milky Way's main progenitor was exactly like at redshift eight. So that means I can put it wherever I want on here. Uh, no, you can't really do that. You can do simulations and ask what it should have looked like. And maybe it would lie down here. The main progenitor might have had a mass of 10 to the 7, maybe up to 10 to the 8. So these are galaxies that are a 1,000 times more massive than the Milky Way's main progenitor would have been at these redshifts, which is, is pretty impressive. Um, they also computed how much stellar mass is there in the universe contained in galaxies more massive than these systems, so the cumulative stellar mass density of galaxies. Uh, and they found at redshift um, eight that there's an excess of a factor of maybe 10 or, or 50. And if you go back to redshift nine, just based again on this small region with a small number of points, there's an excess of a factor of 1,000 or 10,000. So there's a lot more stellar mass in addition to a lot more star formation if these results are correct. Um, so I started to think about this a little bit. And I said, well, you can basically do the same thing in theory for this that you did for the number density of objects. Uh, so in theory, you can predict the, an upper limit to the amount of uh, star formation density that there should be out there, or, or stellar mass density that there should be out there. 
just by weighting the number density of the halos out there, just asking about the baryon reservoirs. And if you do that and you compare uh, to what the observations are, so this is now the cumulative stellar mass density as a function of stellar mass. The data points are from LeBay et al. And the curves are these theory curves from basically press Schechter models. What you find is that to reproduce their results, you need something like a conversion efficiency of, of order 100%. Okay, um, so th th this sort of um, orange line is a conversion efficiency of 30%, that 10% of the previous models had sort of used is, is down in gray here. So you're far off of this, this 10 and pretty far off even of this, this 30%. And you find a similar result at redshift of uh, seven. So they split this into two bins. So I guess the, the, the bottom line is if these stellar mass estimates are right, you're acquiring a uh, conversion of essentially all of the available baryons in a dark matter halo into stars. We know in the low redshift universe, this doesn't happen anywhere. And again, we're not just talking about the stuff that's in the galaxy. We're talking about all of the mass in baryons in the dark matter halo. So most of that is contained at much larger radii. Um, so these would, you know, expect, be expected to sit in very rare dark matter halos. So you can ask, what are the, um, what's the stellar mass as a function of redshift if you have a certain, uh, at, at certain number densities. So these objects are consistent with sitting in dark matter halos that have cumulative co-moving number densities of 10 to the minus five um, per cubic megaparsec if that conversion efficiency is perfect. And that's you know, not coincidentally exactly the size of the survey that these people are doing. If you went to this sort of more standard conversion efficiency of 10%, you would have expected to have to survey a factor of 10,000 more sky before you saw these kinds of dark matter halos. They should be exceedingly rare, one per cubic gigaparsec. So um, this, is, this was a surprise there. And if you, you think about this in terms of these peak heights in the dark matter field, these are peak heights that are something like four and a half sigma excursions all the way out to maybe six sigma excursions, depending on the, the way you do this. Um, so of course, immediately people were a little concerned about these, these, these objects, are they actually real? I will say um, that you know, even without these objects, there are other galaxies that are detected in much larger regions, but, uh, but there are galaxies out there that are kind of these monsters, right? So this is one from Ryan Ensley that has HST and ALMA detections. So it's really measured with, a, uh, well measured in terms of redshift. And the uh, wavelength coverage gives you not just the stellar mass, but also a black hole mass and a star formation rate. This is a very extreme object, right? So these things are out there. This is in Cosmos, which is a much larger survey. So you're now you're really probing very rare things. So it's not surprising to find, or you know, you're gonna find the most massive things out there. But this is just to say there are some of these beasts out there that are have very massive black holes at early times, very high stellar masses and are forming stars at a rate a thousand times the Milky Way is today. Um, so you can kind of model this now and put it all together and ask what is the uh, star formation efficiency in these dark matter halos as a function of redshift. This is some work by a, a guy student, Katie Chorowski in the UT Austin astronomy department working with Steve Finkelstein in the Sears collaboration. Um, and what she's done, this is that same idea of the number density of galaxies as a function of redshift now, all for um, just galaxies that have at least a stellar mass of 10 to the 10. And you can see that uh, these lines here are, are curves of constant conversion efficiency. So this is a conversion efficiency of 100% down to 10%. And the data pretty well match uh, conversion efficiency of 10, 15% from low redshift out to redshift five or so. But as you go to higher and higher redshifts, they're starting to find a change. Okay? And that, that's starting to get um, more and more efficient galaxy formation. I think this star is those LeBay at all points I showed you before, if they're actually correct, it would sit in, in this measurement at a conversion efficiency of say 50%. Um, and, and that's sort of consistent with this extrapolation. So now we're excited to try to understand what's going on at, at higher redshifts. So again, if you wanna know, was this predicted by any of these models? These are some of the models that people had pre-JWST, these different 
um, different curves here. And you can see they match up pretty well at the low redshift regime. And now low redshift means anything below redshift five. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I used to mostly work on near field cosmology. So low redshift is actually blue, red, blue shifted to me. But so redshift five is now a low redshift to, to the high redshift community. Redshift 10 is the high redshift stuff. Um, anyway, so there's good agreement at, at these lower redshifts. But as we go out to higher redshifts, we're starting to see again these, these models were not uh, predicting this. So we don't have a predictive theory of galaxy formation in that level, right? We didn't expect this much um, stellar mass to be built up so quickly in the early universe. Um, so this, if this is true, uh, this would imply nearly perfect conversion efficiency of, of gas into stars, which we just don't really expect. Um, you, could, you could say that might happen, and people have made some of these models. But some other explanations for this would be uh, that the inferred galaxy properties are wrong. We've somehow managed to survey a very strange uh, or atypical portion of the universe, or uh, that the, the cosmology needs some, some adjustment. So um, I'll just briefly talk about a couple of these. Um, the, when things came out first, there was this idea that maybe the, the um, calibration of the near cam instrument in particular was off, and this was the case. There was an issue that has different detectors and they had to be calibrated in space and they weren't exactly calibrated correctly. Um, that's sort of done now. That's made a small change, but not fundamentally changed the picture that we're talking about here. Um, uh, Nada asked this question about the, the redshifts, and sometimes when we're doing this photometrically, you can mistake um, a, a Balmer break for a Lyman break. And so galaxies that are actually, say, at redshift five, again, this low redshift regime could be mistaken for ones that are at much higher redshift. The follow up spectroscopy has said this isn't the case for most of the galaxies there. There are a couple of catastrophic failures that people have found where some sources that could have been really exciting redshift 17 galaxies turned out to be just a redshift five galaxy. Right? Um, and then again, this question of how do we convert between the observed light, which is what we see, and the stellar mass, which is one of the things we'd like to know is kind of complicated. Uh, this question of the stellar initial mass function plays into it. The star formation history that you assume for the galaxy plays into it. The AGN contribution. So if you're attributing light to star formation, it's actually coming from the black hole uh, in the galaxy. That can affect what you're doing. So, uh, but if none of those explanations were to hold up, we could also ask what would have to happen in the cosmological model, what would you have to change to, to get this? Um, and, and the basic point is that here you need sort of faster growth of structure formation. That is, you need to get more uh, matter collapsed up in dark matter halos at early time. So there are more baryons collapsed up at early time so you can get those stars. And you might ask, how can I do that in the standard six parameter lambda CDM model? And the answer is you just can't, okay? The linear, that's the great thing about um, lambda CDM constrained by CMB observations is that the linear theory predictions are very well known. All of the parameters are constrained at sort of 1% precision or even much better. But um, this is a model, okay? And if you add parameters to the model, if you add physical um, attributes to the universe, sources of energy density, then you can change the inferences on these parameters. So what we need is a higher matter density or a higher spectrum of fluctuations, a higher amplitude, or the, the spectral slope of the fluctuations might be different. So that is we might, um, given what we're measuring on the scale of let's say clusters and larger, then the, the, the relative fluctuations on the scale of galaxies, we want to be even larger. So that would be the spectral slope. Um, and so there are a number of, uh, I, this is an underestimate to, to say there are a number of, of solutions. There's, there's papers now that are 500 pages long with a thousand citations with, with um, tons of models in them. But a sort of a characteristic one might be this idea that you inject a little dark energy at early times. So around the redshift of matter radiation equality, redshift of 3,500, there's a different form of dark energy that becomes not dominant, but important for a brief period. So I can see eyes narrowing with every word I was um, saying there. So this is a very strange uh, model. But again, I think this shows you the success of base lambda CDM. It's very hard to, to add things in and not screw up agreement somewhere else. But this is something you could do. 
Um, and if you do this, then basically you now have a nine parameter model. You need to say how much of the universe is, is in this early dark energy at what redshift. And there's a, there's a and one extra parameter. But the point is you can get a, as good a fit to the CMB with this data or with this model, or perhaps even better. Uh, and there have been discussions about whether the Atacama Cosmology Telescope actually prefers this based on their polarization data. Um, and so I think this is actually an exciting topic because it's something where the upcoming ACT data release should really tell us, is this model even viable at all? But this is, again, the very narrow target that you have. We have to, 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 to be able to, to still fit all the, the constraints that we have and modify the base Lambda CDM model. We have to say it's something as far-fetched as this, where you have an extra energy source that contributes 10% of the energy density at redshift of 3,500 and then vanishes right after that. Okay, that's, that's the kind of stuff that you're allowed to do. Everything else is very hard to get away with. So if you do that, you end up uh, and you refit everything. That means you have to get different cosmological parameters, including the matter density, to get a higher matter density. That means um, there's a higher mean density. So things collapse up a little more. You get a higher amplitude of fluctuations. So there are more uh, variance from point to point at a given mass scale. And so you get more dark matter halos. And um, the spectral slope also changes. And again, we're thinking about um, small changes in these parameter values, but we're looking at the exponential tail. So those small parameter changes are, are amplified substantially. So this is one way to think about it is how many more dark matter halos do you get in these, in these kind of models at a given redshift? So at, uh, at low redshift here, redshift one, there's not much of a change in the number density of of halos in this modified cosmology relative to the Planck cosmology. But as you go back earlier and earlier, redshift nine, redshift 15, we're talking about finding maybe five, 10, 20 times more uh, objects at a given dark matter halo mass. The stars here would show you the most massive object you'd expect in a field that's the size of the Sears um, observations. That's where these first observations from Lobey et al. Uh, came from. And the circles show you the most massive object you'd expect in the, um, in the survey that would be done by Cosmos Web, which is 100 times larger in, in volume. This is led by Caitlin Casey at UT Austin. So you can see that uh, you, know, you get very different predictions for the number of objects that are collapsed if this early dark energy model is right. And that, in this kind of uh, model, would move up Every, all these curves up, there's a lot more matter available for star formation. So now we're not in a regime where you lie in this uh, place that's sort of completely impossible. You just lie in a place where you have efficient conversion of, of um, gas into stars. So you will start getting into problems where in, even at small light shift of one or two, by expecting, for example, many more clusters than we observe. Uh, so you, you do get um, slight changes there, but it's not enough to affect the cluster mass functions. This is still consistent with the data that we have at, at low redshift on, on clusters so far, at least. Uh, and part of that is, of course, because of the mass observable relations are a little hard to calibrate. But, you're, now you're not so far out in the tail of the distribution anymore. You're pretty close to the, the base Lambda CDM. So it's true that you, and that's why it's hard to modify Lambda CDM, right? You don't modify it in one place and leave everything else the same. You have to, to fix it at every, every range, right? Yeah. Um, so, okay, this is very contrived. And if I was coming here to sell you this as the answer to the high redshift galaxy problem just on this alone, I think you wouldn't, uh, you know, well, you'd, you'd have brought your tomatoes, maybe you already did, and you'd be throwing them at me by now. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the motivation for this early dark energy model originally wasn't anything to do with high redshift galaxies. It's to solve sort of maybe the, the more exciting tension that people have been talking about, the Hubble tension. So, of course, the, um, the discrepancy between the measurement of the expansion rate based on the CMB assuming this six parameter lambda CDM model and uh, the, the calibrated distance ladder it's now reached five, 5.7, whatever sigma, there's a, there's a large discrepancy here. Um, and, and so 
this was the original motivation for it. And so that's why I think it's interesting to consider that the same model that ex could explain this expansion rate discrepancy would give you the same sort of uh, physics you need to explain more star formation at early times. And so the idea is you inject dark energy at early times. So you have expansion, faster expansion at early times. That means you change the sound horizon somewhat. So you get a smaller sound horizon. That means you need a larger Hubble parameter um, when you fit the data with the CMB. So for example, um, here's, here's some values you can get from, from Smith et al. You can get a move from the Planck constant, uh, from a, not a Planck constant, we don't change that here, okay? Uh, so we, you move from the a Hubble constant of 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec in Planck to 74 in this early dark energy model. And again, you can see the changes in the matter density and the spectral slope. So it's not an enormous change in the, in the physical matter density. It's not an enormous change in the slope of, of fluctuations, but it's enough, once again, once you're looking at the extreme tails of the distribution uh, to, to make a difference. So I'd say, you know, um, is it, it's intriguing, which by intriguing, you should read probably wrong, but I can't sort of, sort of prove that it's wrong yet, is, are, is this Hubble tension and these universe breaking early massive galaxies, are they related? So the last thing I wanted to say about that is um, you don't just change these parameters, you also end up changing the age of the universe in a model like this. So if early dark energy is the right model, the universe, and you solve the Hubble tension with it, the universe is a billion years older or younger than we thought it was in the base uh, cosmological model. And again, that's because the uh, age of the universe is proportional to one over the Hubble constant, basically, and there's a slight omega matter dependence as well. So, um, you know, if you look at the Planck papers, they'll tell you that the age of the universe is 13.78 billion years with an error of only 20 million years. Okay, this is amazing to me that you can actually understand the age of the universe to this high a precision with the, the Planck model. But again, this is, uh, this is a precision, this isn't an accuracy, okay? This is something where you have to assume the model and the way you get the age, there's nothing in, in cosmology about ages. All we know is redshifts or expansions, okay? So to get the age, you integrate over the expansion history. So you integrate over the Hubble parameter. And so that means if you change the energy budget, if you change the underlying model, you change the expansion rate. And that means you change how ages are related to redshifts, okay? So if we uh, sort of take this early dark energy as an exemplar, then really what we're saying is the precision is 20 million years on the age of the universe, but there's a systematic uncertainty lower of about a billion years. So the universe could be a billion years, uh, could be a billion years younger, which would be pretty interesting. And I just wanna point out that basically all of the early solutions to the Hubble tension, all of the ones that modify physics pre-recombination would give you the same thing because all they're doing is changing the sound horizon and you're refitting the, 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 the data in the same way. Uh, and so you're basically just changing the age the exact same way. So all of the early solutions will give you a younger universe. So you might say, well, damn, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to measure the age of the universe that was cosmology independent? And, um, and we do, and that's the way people actually used to do it. Uh, you know, the universe better be older than the oldest things you can find in the universe. A good place to look for old things are collections of coeval old stars, globular clusters, right? So the, as long as um, you can find these things, the, this, all the stars below about um, seven tenths of a solar mass should have an age, a lifetime that's longer than the age of the universe that we're talking about here. And so if we can measure these things uh, ages, then we can set a lower limit on the age of the universe. So um, globular cluster, right? and people have probably seen globular clusters before. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. All right, so the idea here is, um, if you look at these globular clusters, it's very hard to tell their ages, except at, at one place, the main sequence turnoff is sensitive to the age. Okay, so here on the main sequence, there's no way to tell the age. Um, once you're rising in the giant branch, there's no way to tell the age, but where things turn off from the main sequence, you're very sensitive to the age. Uh, and what we've done is we've gone back and sort of redone some of this program that people used to do which is actually try to vary all the stellar physics and understand the uncertainties that go into the age determinations of these globular clusters. So normally people would just set all of these uh, properties and then measure an age relative to isochrones that come 
from assuming this set of stellar physics. Um, with uh, the collaborators here, as is actually led by Brian Shavoya's graduate student, um, Martin Ying. We just varied everything here and tried to understand how old the oldest globular clusters are. And the result we came out with for M92, which was the one I showed you before, is an age estimate of 13.8 billion years with an error of around uh, eight, 800 million years. Okay. And so this includes, in principle, all of the stellar physics uncertainties as well. So this is not just relative to one set of isochrones. Um, and so another way to think of this is that it's older than, it says this globular cluster is older than 12.4 billion years at 97% confidence. Okay. Um, so if we say that, then basically that says this thing had to form by redshift 12 in this early dark energy model. In Planck, you have more time, right? Uh, you can sort of form by redshift four. Uh, and I think the most interesting thing about this work to me, besides the actual number, is that the age um, uncertainty, the, the error budget is dominated by the uncertain distance to this globular cluster, okay? Uh, and so that's a good thing because it's hard to sort of improve precision on some of uh, the, these, these parameters of stellar physics. In principle, we should be able to get better distances to, to globular clusters. Gaia is helping with that, for example. So there may be ways to improve this here. Um, and so basically, I'd say that uh, you know, we have an HST archival program to do this for an additional six clusters. But if we can really reduce this distance uncertainty, uh, globular cluster ages may become competitive again, or at least give us another handle on cosmology, which I think is pretty nice. And one of the important things there is that they can really constrain these alternate cosmologies and, and solutions to the Hubble tension. Because again, any solution to the Hubble tension will reduce the age of the universe if it's an early universe solution. And so these ages, if we can really start to say with, with good confidence that there are older globular clusters, they may rule out all of these early universe solutions to the Hubble tension. Um, so, you know, again, just to conclude, I think the Lambda CDM model is just a starting point for our understanding of the universe. Um, and this accurate cosmological model is really a prerequisite for predictive theories here. Um, tensions are appearing in many places, places, and I think that's a good thing because uh, that means we can investigate things better. A lot of those tensions will disappear, but maybe some of them won't. And those are the ones we need to, to be thinking about. So uh, Lambda CDM is now in some ways a mature model and, and things that wouldn't have qualified as a tension before now actually uh, become potential tensions. And one of these is the JWST observations. And so it's challenging our understanding of, of galaxy formation or you know, potentially cosmology. Again, I wouldn't bet on this being cosmology, but I do think it's important to consider this. The Lambda CDM model is this very phenomenological model. And I don't think we're at the point where we can say the six parameter Lambda CDM model is right. And we should make sure all of our observations of galaxies fit that exactly. We wanna take potential evidence of tension seriously. And then um, if it goes away, it goes away, okay. But uh, you know, the, the real issue here is that you need to, a very efficient conversion of, of gas into stars to, to reproduce the observations. And if this is uh, related to cosmology, then something like these models that solve the Hubble tension go in the same direction as, as solving this kind of issue. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of excitement here because we have new CMB observations that'll come online. Stellar physics uh, can once again become interesting for, for cosmology and JWST continues to, to give us more results. Spectroscopy, not just photometry, will push to higher redshifts, larger volumes. So a lot of excitement here and, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Maybe a couple questions. Um, if early dark energy increases both uh, the matter density and sigma eight, I was just curious how much stronger would it make the S8 tension? Yeah, so it does make the S8 tension a little bit uh, worse, certainly. Um, it's, I think S8 tension is one of those things a little unclear how, how, how tense I should be about it. Um, and you know, I think that there there are a lot of potential explanations there for this the S8 tension, or you know, is, is it a 
isn't a measurement issue, but, but certainly it's not going to go in the way of solving any kind of SA tension. So I think anything that we're thinking of for understanding the, the SA tension in, uh, in sort of base plank, we need extra of that for, for something like this. It goes in the wrong way for that, certainly. Yes. Uh, so a little bit confused about this discussion of star formation efficiency. It seems to be separable to some extent from the question of how many halos of glass. We can count UV photons. Higher star formation for efficiency will give us more UV photons <laughs> per glass halo. But what is the current situation as, as to the, the number of points of light to quote the politician? Um, are there just are there just too many galaxies? Never mind how bright they are, how massive. The number of collapsed halos that we expect from press shifter and the standard model at those ratios. Right. So um, yes, I should have contractually said the great state of Texas when I started my diet. It's in my contract somewhere. I hope they don't fire me. Um, yeah. So I, I, it's true that the just the counting exercise is is good enough if you know how to do the counting. And the problem is you just don't know how to do the counting in terms of stellar mass without assuming the star formation, without assuming something about this, the, how the stars are formed and how to convert between the observed UV luminosity density and the um, stellar mass, right? So I think if you believe the conversion, then um, the, if you believe how people are getting the stellar mass estimates, then there are too many of these for a given region of space, or that's the same thing as saying that you're, you need maximal conversion efficiency here. But, um, but again, there are, there, there are ways out of that without, without, um, without breaking anything else. You change the IMF slightly, you change, um, uh, you change a little bit about how you, your understanding about the galaxy formation processes. So it's, it's not, unfortunately, it's not a completely separable problem. And I'd be happy to talk separately about that if you want. Einstein was a distinguished professor here at Princeton and was a straight man. I said, do you use relativity at all in some of these observations or model? Because I can see a lot of issues with special relativity. And also your Z, there's two ways to calculate Z. One of an observer's frequency in a denominator, the other, that they're emitted frequency in a denominator. But you, it also is possible to make a correction for both through a, an equation that i Oh, okay, well, yeah. Maybe I'd be happy to, to learn more after this. I'll just briefly say that, that yes, you know, the models, at least if you want to fit, um, you know, we're assuming the redshift is a cosmological redshift. There could be a, a peculiar component that's going to be completely negligible at these redshifts. In the theory, for example, for the, the CMB data, you're assuming general relativity is the correct model of gravity on large scales. So that goes into it. But I, I think uh, it's, it's hard to have any discussion without knowing your model. So I'd have to talk with you separately about that. Yeah. One more question I want to just get to, Meta. Just, <clears throat> just to continue on the uh, JW distant galaxies. So as you say, we don't measure the stellar mass directly. We only measure the luminosity. How much do we need to change the conversion of the IMF uh, between the luminosity and the stellar mass in order to match the observations uh, rather than all these very unrealistic 100% conversion from baryons to stars and some of the others. Yeah, let me see if I can pull up something for that. Sorry, just give me one second. Um, so I have to switch the screen I'm sharing. Right, so I think uh, this is a paper that uh, Jacob Shen and Mark Vogelsberger and I and, and Sandro Tekela wrote uh, that basically tries to answer that question. And so you can do, you can match the observations in a couple of directions. The first thing you could do is change the IMF. And so here, uh, what we'll be talking about is uh, sort of a, a UV output that's a factor of, of several 
higher. So we're talking about moving uh, to something like five or 10 times more uh, light, you know, UV photons produced per unit stellar mass in those galaxies. So it's, it's pretty substantial in that direction. The other direction is how much scatter is there in the UV luminosity at a given halo mass. So it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, but these galaxies are sort of uh, forming stars in bursts on and off. If you have very high amplitude bursts, then there are a lot of low mass objects. Then you might mistake those low mass, low dark, low mass dark matter halos for um, higher mass dark matter halos because instantaneously they're forming a lot of stars. So in terms of um, the star formation, um, issue, this could help really help. And I think that's the one that people have sort of latched on to the most. The IMF is a little bit harder in the sense that A, it's harder to constrain and, and B, there's, there's no, uh, you have to go pretty far and C, there's no real evidence for it anywhere else in the universe. So you might be able to look for archeological evidence of a different IMF. You wouldn't see those high mass stars, but you should be able to measure the IMF slope in globular clusters and other places if that's really true at very high redshift everywhere. And so I think there's at least hope for doing that. There's no evidence for it yet, but at evidence of absence and absence evidence, you know, the, the, there's a saying somewhere in there. Uh, and, and so I think that that, that that could be a direction and it's certainly something people are, are thinking about a lot. Okay, there's still a lot of questions, so we have to wrap this up. There's still time on Mike's schedule today and a little bit tomorrow as well. Um, but in the meantime, please join me in thanking Mike one more time.